Bom dia, boa tarde, boa noite. Bem-vindos de volta ao Caesarpedia. Eu sou o César e hoje nós temos um convidado especial no canal. Esse homem é um renomado estudioso da mitologia comparada. É um teacher, é um telestes, conhecido principalmente pelo seu trabalho com o gnosticismo. O seu livro, Não a Imagem de Deus, ele traz de volta à nossa consciência uma cosmologia esquecida, uma narrativa que tem fascinado milhares e milhares de pessoas, inclusive este que vos fala, desde que esse livro foi lançado. O livro Não a Imagem de Deus, ele ensina o poder que o mito tem de formar um caráter, de dar a direção a uma vida e também de orientar os rumos da própria história. Nós somos é, animais guiados por narrativas e o mito é uma narrativa. O autor de Não a Imagem de Deus é um estudioso de longa data das mitologias e religiões mundiais, como o budismo, as religiões abraâmicas, as escolas de mistérios né, da antiguidade e outros assuntos que vão desde a alquimia até Naked Eye Astronomy. É um homem viajado que morou no Japão, no Reino Unido, na Grécia, Bélgica, além da sua terra natal, Estados Unidos, hoje ele mora na Espanha, entre os seus trabalhos. Estão os livros Seeker's Handbook, The Spiritual Guide to a True Spiritual Finding, Twins and the Double, The Hero, Manhood and Power, e Quest for the Zodiac. É também fundador da escola online Nemeta.com. Senhoras e senhores, Mr. John Lamb Lash. So, John, welcome to the channel. Thank you very much. I'm thrilled to be here and to have the opportunity to speak to you and you are my medium uh, to speak to people in Brazil and all those who have the Portuguese language. I once said many years ago as a joke, you know, I think if everybody in the world spoke Portuguese, it would the world would be a better place. <laughs> you know, you know that, so uh, I've, uh, I've listened to a lot of Fado and I've listen to Sergio Mendes yes. and you know I've always had the musical spirit of Brazil in my mind and I, I very much love that and enjoy that spirit because I know that the Brazilian people are party animals you know we say in uh, America you're a party animal they love to dance and they love to yeah. sing and this this is important yeah yeah, yeah. And the, the Brazilian people they have these uh, unique uh, traits of the yeah great I, I believe yeah we are we are happy people in general very very cool uh well not in his image no i imagine de deus is a reality mm -hmm. yes, it has been released a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. and what do you say about it well i glad you asked that question because i wanted to say that what i was thinking what could i say to anyone listening To translate into Portuguese, what could I say in Portuguese that would focus immediately about my book? So you see the cover and you see the eyes in the sky, right? That is the eyes of uh, the goddess, right? Yeah. Which goddess is that, you know? Well, this goddess is primarily the goddess of the earth, mother nature, Okay, so my book brings attention back to her as Mother Nature. Let's be sane. Let's be aware that we are creatures of nature. Our life comes out of nature. But it also has, of course, the transcendental image, which is the Sophia, which is a great story of uh, the cosmos. So I wanted to say at the beginning to all the Portuguese people that I dedicate our talk to the main subject of my book, and that is Imanjá. Imanjá. Yeah, This that, is Imanjá. Yeah. I'm talking about Imanjá, but I'm not just talking about her in the folk lore, you know, the festival of Imanjá on January 1st, and all this is beautiful. I'm talking about the deep background of that feminine figure. And I know that she is beloved by the Brazilian people. Yeah. And yeah. So I'm saying, I'm your man. I'm here. This white 
Irish Italian guy, you know, but I'm talking about the goddess. I'm talking about Yemanja. Yeah. Cool. Yemanja is big here. Yeah. Of course, of course. Brazil is a Christian country. Yes. Uh, but we are very much into the syncretism. And uh, my wife has a Yemanja right in front of me here. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, she has an altar here with all the goddesses that are available in statue. Uh, it's pretty cool. Yemanja is right in the front. She is, yeah, and she comes from the sea, by the way. She is the sea goddess, and all life comes from the sea. Yeah, yeah. So, when you go and give their gifts to the sea, this is good practice because it's saying we recognize that the sea is the womb of the mother, and all, all life comes from the sea. Now, there's another detail that I want to point out before we get into our conversation about Imanja, and uh, I propose you use uh, Sergio Mendes' Brazil 77 as the theme song for our talk, because okay. he has a beautiful song, right? I'll but listen, it. it's associated with uh, Condomble. Okay, fine, I understand that. This is a cultural thing. But in fact, Condomble is a religion of West Africa. Okay, it is not the indigenous religion of Brazil. So I just want to emphasize to those who know who Imanja is to recognize that she is the mother spirit and guardian, guardian of children, right? Yeah. Of your country. And it's not, it doesn't come imported from West Africa. Okay. It's a very yes. important. <laughs> Yeah, the deep, deep, deep background of it is not Africa. That's right, exactly. Yeah. Anyway, not that there's anything, oh, not that there's anything wrong with African folk religion. I've talked a lot about it. There are goddess figures in Zulu religion, in African religion. I've talked about them, but you need to claim your own goddess and see her in your imagination as the goddess of your land and your coast. Yeah. yeah. That's it. Very, very important issue. You, 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 you. Your book. So you questions for me, or so you yeah. want to go to the book? No, no, yeah, yeah. Here we have the first one. Uh, your book is, uh, your book hammers on a couple of concepts, and one of them is telos. Telos is the goal, the objective, the aim uh, of one individual. Uh, so what was your telos when you wrote this book? And have you achieved your goal so far? I don't, I don't know if I've achieved my goal, says Ari. It's not for me to say. It's for other people to say. I feel that I have done everything so far I could possibly do. My telos, my aim, my objective was simply to bring back not simply the knowledge of the wisdom goddess, who is a version of Imanja, Imanja Sophia, yeah. but also to bring her living presence back to the world so that you don't need my book to go see her. You don't need my book to uh, connect with her. You don't even need to believe what I say in my book. But what I say points you to her presence. And this is the key word, her presence. presence. Oh, and that right. was that was my pillows. That's why you have the eyes in the sky. Yeah. Yeah, you are you are achieving it because uh, you know many, many, many people have uh, checked your book and uh, worldwide, I mean, and you know, you have pretty strong uh, group of people, for example, in Sweden, in America. Yes, I do. Uh, yeah, so I think you're you somehow have brought back uh, the goddess to some kind of level of conscience, and this is pretty cool, really, really nice. Yes, it is very cool. <laughs> yeah, your your book is you, you said in, in the preface in the preface of of your book that uh, you your book is like a symphony. You have four parts, so yes. part, part one gives you a, a kind of historical background. Uh, you know, con conquest and conversion is the title of part one. 
Right. So it gives you the basis for part two um, to get to the narrative of the goddess, the myth of Sophia. Mm -hmm. got the scenario and in Portuguese we say a história da deusa caída. A história da deusa caída. Da deusa Sim. caída, yes. So, Sim. But, and, uh, and part two, you know, the narrative like prepares you for part three, which is history's hardest lesson yeah and um and in part four seems one two and three in a unity which uh brings us the sophianic vision or the sophianic message and the future yes let me let and, me comment on part three go ahead what is history's hardest lesson yeah this is one of the questions i have that. for you so i am a scholar of religion and philosophy and mysticism and shamanism and Gnosticism and yoga and Tantra and blah, 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 right? But it all began when I was a child, when I was a boy growing up in a little fishing village in Maine, probably not so different from the fishing villages along the coast of Brazil. You know what a fishing village looks like. Yes, I grew yes, up there. Yes. And it so happened that that fishing village was occupied by a Christian cult. So there was a church there and it was a very big influence on everyone in the village, which was 900 people. Okay. And as a young child, of course, uh, I was influenced to join that religion. It's a form of what we would call evangelic Christianity, which is very big in Brazil. I know this big, big. very big. And so I was, exposed to evangelic Christianity at a very early age. And that's when it all began, because I can tell you that I did not like it at all. No way. I, I did not. The, I know the feeling. I did not like the people. It was creepy. There was something wrong. But, you know, children are so brilliant. They know something is wrong but they don't know how to define what is wrong. So you could say that my whole course of life from friendship, Maine, it's called friendship, to writing, not in his image, was to figure out what was wrong. I knew it was wrong at the age of 10 years old, but I couldn't define it. And in the preface of the book and in part three, I explain what is wrong. History's hardest lesson is that the millions of people who have embraced religious morals and Christianity and ideology and the Ten Commandments have actually been betrayed by their highest ideals. They think Christians today, all over the world, and Brazil is no exception, they think that because they call themselves Christians, they hold some higher morality but my book shows that that higher morality is a deceit and a fraud and that your religious beliefs betray your humanity that is the message and i knew that when i was king eight years old but i didn't have the language or the intellect to explain it yeah and uh, in the preface the preface of this yeah this, this edition here, uh, is, yeah. uh, that's when you, I first got in touch with this interesting point of view. Yeah. yeah. We, it's like, a, I like to say today, of course, in a, in a different context, I like to say that people should identify themselves with the smell of it. If it smells bad, go away. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, something smells bad for you, definitely. Something smells bad, but at the <laughs> same time, the, those who today still hold to Christian faith, Christianity, are, they are captured. They are captured by an ideology that, unfortunately, if something doesn't change, uh, it cannot improve what is wrong in the world. So I speak to Brazilian people today of conscience, adults and young people, if you think that there's something wrong in the world, something wrong with the government, wrong with the media, wrong with the way 
that uh, we live our lives, then at a certain point, I ask you, can you find the courage to realize that you cannot correct what is wrong through your religion? Your religion is a part of what is wrong. It's a big part of it. Right? It's a hard lesson. Yeah, it's a very hard lesson. And I realize what I'm asking people. I realize I'm asking a lot. Yeah. But I, why do I do that? I'm just a man who discovered certain things, what I think to be the truth. And I put my case to you and you decide. But if you do not have the courage to accept even the possibility that your religious faith is not a solution for a better world, then you are part of the problem. <laughs> yes. You hear, me? you hear me? Yes. I'm being as clear as I can be. <laughs> yes, straight to the point. It's like the bullseye. Yeah, no, that's it. This is it. Uh, the, the disposition to uh, uh, even... But to say as in the first to give up, but at, least, but at least to analyze the principles of uh, what's in the game. Yeah, yeah. Basically, uh, uh, yeah, the first contact I had with your work was the sabotage in Gnostic um, in the Book of Revelation. Gnostic no, sabotage. Sabotage in the Book of Revelation. Yeah. Uh, right. The way the way you put it, it was like this. Uh, let, let's put things clear on the table. And let's see who is playing what in this narrative of the apocalypse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that was mind blowing, man. From that on, <laughs> you know, so I took the, I took your advice and I really tried, I really went after the sources of it all. And it's a life changing experience, basic, basic. This it is, it is for many people. Yeah. Uh, many people have written me through the years and the one consistent thing they say is that reading not in his image uh, broke the spell. Yeah. It liberated them from the delusions of Christian faith. Yeah. 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 And, I, and I thank you very much for that. Part one, we talk about a lot about history. We start with the Hypatia uh, assassination. And then you go through the Roman and the empire under the justification of Christ uh, and everything they did to erase. You know that's the inter intellectual cleansing that yes. you that you build yeah. in the first part of the book. And then the Zadkin, the core, yes. the source of the what we call today Christianity, yes. the Messiah thing, and etc. So, um, intellectual cleansing, why? You say that uh, the Sophianic message is the once and future heresy? Yes. That it's the greatest taboo in human history. So, why yes. don't you develop these ideas very interesting and deep? Well, it's a taboo, a heresy, by the way simply means you choose what you believe. So when I grew up in that small town in Maine, they said, oh, we're not going to give you the choice to what you believe. We want you to join our cult and be baptized and accept Jesus as your savior. And honestly, I'm, I'm not, I'm transparent and honest, which is one factor perhaps why a lot of people don't, like to talk to me, but I can tell you, I hated them. I hated those people for what they were trying to do to me, but I couldn't explain it. You understand, children know, we all know as children, in one way or another, that something is wrong, but it's a battle to figure out what exactly is wrong. So what is the essence of the Gnostic heresy? that had to be eliminated because it is the most dangerous message in the world. The message that I bring is the most dangerous message in the world. And what is the essence of it? Well, there are two factors in this 
message. The first factor is that you find it in the narrative, in the fallen goddess scenario. So it says in the narrative, in the myth, myth that uh, what you call God, what people call God in the Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition is actually not God. It's a demented alien. And I use that exactly, literally. It's not a poetic figure of speech. It's a demented alien uh, agency that is not in the earth, not of the earth. It comes from outside. It comes from the solar system. It doesn't come from the cosmos, you know, at large. So when the Gnostics came out of the mystery schools and they started to argue with the Christians uh, around 150 AD is the earliest record they have, they said, uh, hold on here. You've got, you had Judaism and now you have Christianity after St. Paul, right? St. Paul, by the way, I want to ask anybody who's listening, are you a Christian? If you are a Christian, do you know that Christianity is Judaism? Do you know that? And I'm not making that up. It's just a fact, you know? So you had Judaism, the root of the whole problem, uh, the Zedekim, and then you had Christianity and the divinity of Christ, the resurrection. What is today? Holy Saturday. It's great that we're having this talk on Holy Saturday. Yeah, it couldn't be the best day, yeah. Couldn't That's be a right. better day, yeah. So the first point is that the Gnostics came out and said, what you call God, the God you worship, the God who gives you the rules to live by, is a pretender, is an alien, is a phony, is a fake. I mean, this is the most heretical statement that has ever been made yeah. in all of human history. And for that, they had to destroy the Gnostics because they could not let that information get out, right? Yeah. And the second thing that the Gnostics said, which is still taboo today, is that they explained how this alien parasite mind, which is now we call it in America, the woke mind virus. That's what it's called today. How this alien mind parasite got into our planet. And that is a very, very taboo subject. Even I have to be careful about how I talk about that on the internet. Yeah. Because certain things that you say about certain people, you can say them, and I have said them, but they will take you off the social media for saying those things. So this is a very powerful message that can change everything in our world. And I'm... I am happy to know that it is reaching the world as I intended, as I intended, you know? Nice. Okay. Yeah, that's a big taboo. Don't touch, mm. don't touch uh, the, resp the responsibles for that. Don't yeah, don't them. touch, don't talk about the people who are responsible. They can say anything they like about you. Yeah. And they do. But you cannot say anything about them. You can. You are free to say what you think and know. But there are consequences. Yeah. yeah. On the other hand, they can say anything and there are no consequences. This is what has to change. Yeah. This is what has to change, basically. This is, this is a very, very delicate issue. Anyway, yeah. um, I've been working uh, in the channel now uh with the episodes of the myth of sophia i am about to do episode seven probably next week and uh you know it's a narrative in which uh there is uh, a thread and you can find traces of this the same story in different texts in Nara in the nag hammadi scriptures which is the beginning of part two of this book. You talk about the Nag Hammadi, uh, the discovery, and uh, you go for the myth of Sophia. So there is this entity. She is responsible for this earth. She is the earth. 
and uh, you have this one of the consequences of her being the earth is this alien entity that's that, right yeah that's so, right so that's a wild narrative there is it's a, like a roller coaster for it's been a mm -hmm. roller coaster for me because you know when you go deep into the mm -hmm. sources of it it's unbelievable so how is the narrative relevant for the people of today you know because it was relevant for the gnostics relevant enough to have them killed and you know genocide can be applied to what they have done to what they did to to the gnostics and so how is it relevant today why is sophia relevant today well i've been thinking a lot about that and by the way i want to say that right now i'm right on this computer screen up here which is this computer i'm developing the 18 episode version yeah. of the narrative. so the nine episode version which has been for 15 years in the world more than that uh is good and it's reliable but i have an improved version which will be the final version version so let me say this there are two factors that i would say uh will show you, I'm not going to convince people here that the Sophia, Sophianic narrative of the Fallen Goddess scenario is what it is. It is the most complete and coherent myth of creation ever produced by human beings. And fragments of it and parts of it can be found in other mythologies, Aztec, Chinese, Polynesian, but the whole story comes together there. I'm not going to convince anyone of that. I've already proven that. So what do I want to say now? Why is it important? And also, I want to say, by the way, it would be uh, an omission if I didn't say this. It's complicated. It's a complicated story. It's a complex story. Yeah. And so you have a certain passion, a certain will to learn, and you have to dedicate time to it. It's not something that you can just take in a spoon and just swallow it. Yeah. And I realize this, I do. So there are two factors in your own lives, people living in the world in Brazil, that determine whether you will be able to benefit from the story. One of them is imagination. And the other one is fear. Fear is a very big factor in whether or not you, listening to me, can become uh, involved with this story. You see? Because one of the things that distinguishes this story of Sophia, which is the biography of the earth, it tells you everything. It tells you how the earth came to be, everything is that there is no fear in it. Yeah. Now, compare that to the narrative of the Bible. The Father God, wrathful, jealous, looking at everything you do, giving you the rules to live. If you don't follow the rules, punishing you. There is no punishment and no fear in this story. But do you have the courage to go into a world where there is no punishment and no fear? So that is something very emotional. You know, one of the things that anchors people in the Abrahamic religions, and that's Jews, Christians, and Muslims, is that they're afraid of God. But everyone who has learned this story, is they're not afraid of the goddess. How can you be afraid of the goddess? She is your divine mother. Look at, look at her. Look at the beauty of nature. Look at the beauty of Brazil, yeah. of the wild, insane beauty. And that is your mother. You cannot, there's nothing to be afraid of. But people are, because of the virus, the minds of people are captured in this 
scenario of fear. If I do not do what God says, I will be punished. Either I will be punished now or I will be punished in the last judgment. So part of the power that holds people in Christian faith is their fear. But there is no fear in this story. There's only joy, wonder, beauty, magic. You see, that's the alternative. Choose the story. You have the opportunity today to choose the story that ought to have been so 2,000 years ago. But the Christian ideologues did not allow people to know the story, so they could not choose. As I said in a talk, you know, if people had been free at that time to say, do you want to become a Jew, which is what a Christian is, Christianity is Judaism, and do you want to follow the Judaic religion of the Abrahamic father God, or do you want to follow the goddess religion? Excuse me. What What is the better choice? But they never had that choice. Yeah. Okay? Now you have the choice. The other thing that I want to say, and I don't want to go into this too long, but it's really important. So I would ask people listening, what do you do with your imagination? Because you need imagination to comprehend the Sophianic myth. And I just want to say this, I've been thinking about this a lot, and I don't want to go into a long digression about it, so I'll compress it very fast. It's come to my attention over the last few years that there are things that happen in the world that I don't know anything about, okay? Because I'm not on social media very much, and I don't follow. But it's come to my attention mainly because of what's happening in Hollywood and because of the catastrophe of Hollywood films lately. Hollywood got woke and they started to make all these films where they swapped the gender and the race. They turned the male, they, they destroyed the male superheroes, the superhero men of Star Wars and Indiana Jones. They destroyed them and trashed them like a pathetic old man like me. You know, I'm like Indiana Jones. I'm a pathetic old man, right? Get rid of that pathetic old man and bring in the black female heroes and the lesbian female heroes, you know. And, and that is causing Hollywood to destroy itself, okay? This is a phenomenon. I don't know if you know, but it brought to my attention a fact, which is that there are millions of people around the world who are fascinated and involved in all of these fictional characters of what I called adult fantasy fiction. Yeah. Now, I don't know how that is in Brazil. Well, you know? well, give you one example. The, 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 you are talking about the Avengers. Spider-Man, uh, Spider-Man, yeah, Superman. Huge here. My God. Captain Marvel. My kids grew up on that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Peace. And I, I, I was there, uh, John, every single of those movies. Yeah, right. So it's a big <laughs> cultural phenomenon, right? And I never, like, I said, I don't, I'm not a gamer. I don't go to these movies. But then it began to dawn on me that there are millions and millions of people in all countries around the world who follow the story of Star Wars, okay, so who is the who is the villain in Star Wars? Right, Darth Vader. Yeah. Okay. So people in Brazil know who Darth Vader is, right? They surely do. But do you know that Jesus is just like Darth Vader? Satan, then, then just yeah, like yeah. Darth Vader. It's just a fantasy fiction. I see. You see. And so it really. I've learned in the last year or so the magnitude of this adult we call it adult fantasy fiction and even the harry potter books belong to that yeah. because even though they're directed to children they are many adults read them no, and there are John, uh, harry potter was a market builder 
because yeah. those kids are now watching Avengers. Uh, this is the this is the issue. It was a plan. Harry Potter is a plan. so. The point I'm making is that what are you doing with your imagination? Well, if you're someone who has all the collection of Star Wars and Spider Man and superheroes, and you have them all, and you watch, that's like being a Christian. Yeah. This is the thing. Jesus Christ is a fantasy. The resurrection that's supposed to happen tomorrow, it's a fantasy. If you believe that, you are a child. You have the mentality of a child of 10 years old. Take some responsibility for how you use your imagination. And the beautiful, one of the beautiful features about the Sophianic myth is that it totally allows you to use your imagination in the best way, in a beautiful way, in a liberating way. And I believe that the power of that story is the greatest narrative story in the world. And it's not fiction. The yeah, evidence is all around us, the yeah. evidence. So... Uh, that's just something I wanted to say because those two factors, fear, fear of what? You know, the Gnostic said, oh, the God that created the world pretends to create the world. They never said that he created the world. They said he pretends to. Uh, and he gives you these rules, which you call the Ten Commandments, or the rules of Christian morality. And you're in fear of a spiritual authority if you don't obey those rules. Well, excuse me, but when you go to the Sophianic message, there is no fear and there are no rules like that. You make your own rules. You decide what is moral and right. You do not rely on a book or G what Jesus said, you, you must take responsibility for your own morality. And unless you can do that, you are part of the problem. And I'm not sorry to say that. I confront you directly. Are you part of the problem or are you part of the solution? And as long as your morals still depend on some man who died for your sins and rose from the dead, then you are part of the problem. I can't, I can't get yeah. this message. Yeah, no, it's okay. I know I'm being, I know I'm being very strong. Yeah, I follow you. But, but I'm also being friendly. I'm not saying this to, to threaten you, uh, to harm you, you know. Uh, yeah, do I want to destroy your faith? Absolutely, I want to destroy your faith. <laughs> Okay. Absolutely, I admit it. But why do I want to do that? Do I have some evil plan? No. It is the, planning, right? Yeah, it's the most liberating thing you can do. Yeah. Is yeah, yeah to, this is something interesting. Recently, I've been reading a lot about this history uh, of what happened in Russia in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the goals of those Bolshevik was to destroy Christian faith. Uh, or destroy, you know, they killed everybody, the priests, and right. they just did something very, very horrible there. It's not this kind of destruction you mean, of course. You don't want no, to. No, really, <laughs> I'm really glad you brought that up because I was waiting. Yeah. You know, people don't confront me, yeah. nobody dares to argue with me, you know that. But I thought, well, why doesn't somebody come on the internet and invite me and say, well, Sean Lash? You're supposed to be a great spiritual teacher, but you are uh, proposing the destruction of Christianity, and that's exactly what the Bolsheviks proposed. Yeah. So aren't you promoting the Bolshevik prob uh, program of communism? And I'm so uh, please come on the internet and confront me on that <laughs> because I have a very simple answer. Yeah, I am proposing the abandonment of Christianity. Yeah, that's totally different. Right, but not for the same reasons that they are. Not at all. Well, abandon, abandonment is not destruction. 
That's and right. Destruction in the sense of you know blood and everybody and everything. That's right. Uh, one of the things you say on part four, part three, we're going to jump because we talked about the hardest mm -hmm. lessons already. So, on part four, you take part one, two, and three, and you come up with a kind of a unity message of the Sophia Nicanism, and you say something. Uh, Sophia, the, the Sophianic message is not a religion. It's not an alternative religion. It's the uh, alternative to religion. Yes. And uh, alternative to religion. Uh, so this is this is where I want to 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 go. Brazil is a Christian nation. Jesus is big here. He, uh, the Jesuits they did a very good job when they came to this part of the planet. So Jesus is ethos here. It's part of people's lives. It's part of their narrative. We are narrative-driven animals, as you said. And Jesus is the narrative down here. Um, how is it, I mean, is it possible to destroy an ethos? I mean, could the Bolshevik destroy Christianism in Russia? This is the point. Ethos is something very, very, very deep in the hearts of the people. It's the narrative. So how can you substitute one narrative to the other? That's the, the question here. Because the narrative of Sophia is kind of that's kind of different from the Semitic mythology. So how can you how can people abandon the old ethos and embrace the new narrative? This is a very interesting issue. Well, Great question, and we could talk about that for a long time. But what I like about this question is that I can happily say that I am the source of that option. I'm proposing that option. Abandon that faith, and yet I don't know how it's going to work out because it's much bigger than me. So, you know, I'm the author of Not in His Image. I have my opinions. But I would say, to, to try to be helpful, I would say that if you, if you listening can even consider what I'm talking about, then I ask you to consider this proposition. It's very simple. It's like, I call it a meme. You know what memes are? You have memes in Portuguese? Like we, right. we, we feed on memes, uh, John. Well, here's a meme for you. We are we are part of the global world, global society. All right, no, you are. They, 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 right. like that. So here's your meme. When values or ethos, I'm going to use ethos. When ethos parts from faith, that's the meme. When ethos goes its own way without faith, that is the crossroads that my book brings you to. Yeah. So how can I uh, advise you as to how to look at that? Okay? Well, let's look first at faith. Do you need faith in Jesus to be a good person? Do you need faith in Jesus to know that it's wrong if someone kicks a dog or if someone touches a child in the wrong way. Do you need faith to uphold your ethos? This is the crossroads. You, you take this road and you say, this is hypothetically, I'm going to ask you, what if? What if you stand at this crossroads and you say, okay, I'm going to abandon this faith. I'm not going to believe in these fairy tales anymore. I'm not going to wake up tomorrow on Sunday and believe that Jesus rode from the, rose from the dead and uh, suffered for my sins. I'm not going to believe it because it's just a fantasy. Okay? And I'm going to leave the fantasy away. And then I'm going to stay with my ethos. So how do I define my ethos independent of the fantasy of faith? This is the big question. 
And how would I answer that if I was standing in front of you now, if there were people, we were together and there are Portuguese people in this room, Brazilian people, I would say, let's get real. Do you really need a law written in stone that says that it's bad to rape women? Do you really need a, a God off the planet to tell you that it's bad to cheat people and steal from them? Do you need that? Could you possibly in yourself solve those ethical problems? You see? So it's the crossroads where faith goes there and you forget it because it's fantasy. The resurrection of Jesus Christ on Easter morning is a fantasy like Harry Potter and Superman. And then you say, okay, I'm not going to use my faith to support my ethos. Where do I find my ethos? My friends, the ethos can only be found here. It's, it's in your conscience. It's in your humanity. You don't need God to tell you how to behave like a good human being. It's like Only, it's, the, it's, it's the inner navig inner navigation mechanism. That's what you say. That's right. Yeah. It's what people have called by various names. They call it conscience. They call it the moral compass. Yeah. You know, and it's in your heart. It's in your feeling. It's in your feeling, not only for your own humanity, but for the humanity of others, and also for all of nature that is not human. Yeah. All animals, all species, the rivers, the clouds, the sky. What do you feel about all that? What you feel about all that is the source of your ethos, not commandments that come with fear with threats. Everything that Jesus taught comes with threats. Yeah. You can't command and people to love, can you? You cannot command <laughs> people to love. It's one of the things I say in my book, and I was yeah. I remember writing that chapter, <laughs> you know, the true message of love. And I it came to my mind and I thought it's so brilliant and it's so obvious. You love a puppy, you love a beach. You love a river where you go with your family for a picnic somewhere in the in the jungles in the beautiful country. And did anyone command you to love those places? Yeah. It's absurd. Love thy neighbor is bullshit. Yeah, you it's can, not you, you cannot you, be commanded to some, love anyone. Some people just can't be loved. Yes, that's this right. Is, is this something that people should understand writing, you know, uh, from now on? Some people just can't be loved. You can't love some kind, of, and 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 there you go. There is. A, it reminds me what you said in the beginning about the good versus evil, God versus uh, the devil, to right. or your soul. The Dostoyevsky thing. If there is no God, everything goes. Right. Uh, but the good versus evil, God versus devil for your soul is bullshit. Right. Yes, yeah, it's, it's not. <laughs> it, Nietzsche said. And in the genealogy of morals, and I was very influenced by Nietzsche, because he said God is dead. It's a good thing that he said God is dead. But I would say, if I was speaking for Nietzsche today, I would put my hand, you know, around his shoulder, because he's a big pal of mine. And I would say, Nietzsche, it would be better if you had said, it's time for faith in God to die. So that we can realize our responsibility for being human. That's very simple. And you're right. This is the biggest issue of all, but actually it comes down. It's really simple. It comes down to fear and imagination. That's why you don't say Sophia. You say Sophia. That's right. I say Sophia because fear has fear in it. And Sophia has fire. In it, right? Yeah. Desire, <laughs> fire. Yeah, that's it. Okay, um, what message, just to close this session today, what message would you give just to, to close to our Brazilian counterparts, readers, 
followers, whatever they are? Well, uh, I would say that I have come to realize that what I have done is possibly an exceptional achievement. Okay, it's for, it's for others to say. But I want you to know, personally, I'm sitting here talking to you like you're a close friend. You are my close friend. And by the way, for to translate, I don't know if the people listening will realize what it takes to translate. <laughs> they don't know. They don't know. You have no idea. Yeah, yeah. I am honored you to be called your friend. The, friends, difficulty, uh, yeah, the difficulty of the way I write. Yeah. I write like no one else on in the world. It's a beautiful and writing, my friend. Beautiful writing. People say that, but it is difficult. Yeah. And there are difficulties in accepting, you know, this message so that it becomes the truth that you say, oh, I didn't hear from John Lash. I, I just I realized, yeah, this is really my truth. This is my conscience and my feeling of responsibility. I can't make anybody responsible. You take the responsibility yourself. It's like a commandment, no commandments. Yeah, there are no commandments in the Sophianic religion except two, right? They are make yourself comfortable and watch your boundaries. <laughs> That's a good one. That's good too. In my knowledge, you know, because one of my crazy grandiose claims is that I claim to be able to talk to the earth and, you know, and once I first I talked to her in the first conversation, I said, you know, what are your rules? What are your laws? And she said, make yourself comfortable and watch your boundaries. And that is so beautiful and so yeah. true. Yeah, and boundaries boundaries takes us directly to the symbiont, which is a peculiar character in the narrative of Sophia, which is uh, something that uh, comes in this, the new edition of Nine yeah. Days Witch. The, the symbiont. Right is in the place of Christ, Christo. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So, so what do you say you about want, these boundaries? If you, don't, if you are willing to accept that Jesus is like, you know, a wizard and a savior in Harry Potter or Superman or Spider-Man, and you don't want to be a fool, you don't want to act like an eight-year-old child, uh, then you say, well, can Gnosis provide a substitute for Jesus? And yes, there is a substitute. And that substitute is called the symbiont. Okay? And this is a very beautiful part. And I'm really glad that after 15 years, I was able to develop the narrative to this way. So what is the symbiont? And what is the formula of the symbiont? You know? I don't know if I can repeat it, because sometimes I can't even quote myself. But let me try. It's a guideline for you. So I will put it to you in the first person. You, as a human being, can only know the measure and power of your humanity relative to how you feel about non-human animals and non-human life. You see? So if you have a great feeling for animals, for trees, for the rivers, for the beauty of nature, if it moves you, then that is the measure of how strong your humanity is as well. This is the message of the symbiont. It's a very important message in, in the fourth part of the book, right? Yeah. But to conclude, let's get back to your question. You know, what, where do we go from here? You know, and what is what is the essential what is the essential message I would leave with you about my book? And I think I will just go back to something I've often said, which is literally true. Okay. Is your mother alive? Is your mother alive? My mother's alive, yeah. Okay. My mother's not alive. Okay. But whether or not your mother is alive, she's your mother, right? Yeah. 
You know, one thing I want to say about the transgender movement, that's another topic we could get into, yeah. is no matter which you might say you're, there are what, 50 different genders, like right? They say, yeah, as they say. Now, you can tell me or any gender you like. I don't, I don't have to believe you. But every single gender came up into the world between the legs of a woman. That is undeniable, right? Yes, definitely. We all came through the same doorway, okay? <laughs> so you have your biological mother, but you also have your divine mother. You have two mothers. So if you love and respect your mother because she gave you birth, can you expand that feeling of love and respect to the divine mother who gave you birth? And then you're in the game. Then you're in Sophianic animism. Yeah. That's the road ahead. That's the road to a better way of life and, and a better world. It's simple. Yes, uh, I have. So yes, I, as you know, I am a teacher. I teach English. And uh, recently I came across one student and uh, she was pretty at least when she talked to me, she just didn't care for her mother. So what do you, how, uh, what do you expect from a person that just didn't care for their natural mother? So do you think well, these people a, would I love the new one? No. And I have to admit that you, get, you have to get a license to drive a car, but you don't have to get a license to be a parent. <laughs> and you know <laughs> yes a lot of a lot of children uh honestly and legitimately are disappointed by their parents and they have every right to be that's realistic i was disappointed by my parents you know my mother did something which happened in my childhood and i didn't talk to her for nine years because I was so angry at what she did, which I felt betrayed her right, her responsibility to protect me, she betrayed it. And she let a molester into my world, a molester. I resisted that molester, but I resented my mother and I punished her, you know? We reconciled in the last years of her life. So it's okay if you don't love your parents, and maybe your parents don't even love you. It's not a given. It's something that has to be developed. The fact that you have biological parents doesn't mean that they automatically love you. And you are lucky if they do. But your divine mother is different. It's unconditional. If you can realize that she loves you, look at the world. Look at this world we live in. Look at the natural beauty of Brazil. Just the natural beauty. That's her beauty. You are a child of her beauty. And to love nature is to love your divine mother. And I would say that everything I've taught and written about is kind of like, I want to show you that option. You know? yeah. and point you in that direction. Say, hey, look, look over here. That's the ultimate purpose and how it works out I don't know, but I would say we're in a big crisis right now in the world, and I think it's good. I think that everything, if everything melts down and breaks down, it's going to be good, because then the good people can come together and build a new foundation yeah. for our society, because society is criminal. Governments are criminal. Politicians, they're criminals. All of them. The, the big corporations. Yeah. Heads of pharmaceutical companies are criminal. And so if the system breaks down, it means that the criminal system breaks down. And then we have, of course, the responsibility out of our own heart and conscience to recreate a better world. Yeah, yeah. And it will take probably a couple of generations. Well, but, but it uh, will happen fast. It will happen fast, is our least. I believe yeah. so. No, we have I, the knowledge. I I'm mean, very we, fast. we have the expertise. We are not, we act like children, but I think when it comes down to real deal, uh, I think we are going to be pretty, 
responsible when you know when you don't have more the, the, the support of all these illusions anymore. Exactly. Yeah, yeah you said the, you, you said one sentence. You said one phrase in one of these thousands of hours of interviews, and I don't know where if it was an interview or, or a lecture uh, to prove that you love her, learn her story. So this is what really stick stick to me um, when I fell in love with with the story. You. That's the only way to prove you love her is to learn right. her story and you know being part of it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, do you do you love the story of your own life? You born some, as, some, you know, some stories are tragic. Yeah, uh, they are, but you can <laughs> love them. You can love that story whether it's tragic or not. Yeah. Well, is. I can say, and I think I can speak for you as well. You're looking at two men who love the story of the mother earth goddess as much as they love the story of their own life yes definitely yeah, yeah. we have peculiar lives uh, john uh, 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 i still I, i have my beats too one day if we have the chance uh, I'll, 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 we talk about more about it so, well you're yeah. welcome to come here you know we've been invited to spain i invite yeah. you again nice and may the spirit of iman ja <laughs> you Lead you to me. And uh, we can... uh, uh, my, my my wife told me this morning we should pay a visit to John. You know, sure. Uh, you sure. know, but you know, money is uh, is an issue. So I don't know. Maybe in the future, who knows? Maybe we get some lottery prize, and uh, we I, I invite you for a paella. <laughs> right. <laughs> cool. Cool. So so John, that's it for today. Um, I hope we have more of these talks. Uh, it's been sure. a pleasure. It's been a real pleasure. It's like talking to, you know, two guys talking, you know, on the same page. That's, that's, yeah, that's right. So thank, well, thank you, very... you as well yeah. for the opportunity to speak so directly to the hearts and minds of my friends, my future friends in Brazil. So thank you, Cesar. We'll You're see welcome. you. Ciao. Nice. Pato pato, pato pato, pato pato.